Yeah? Okay. Here you are now. So I'm introducing the, the next speaker, a very demanding speaker who wants to be introduced. Um, so I hope everyone who just came back from lunch knows how much did you spend at lunch today? Because that's what we'll be covering today, personal finance uh, with Jacinta Richardson, who is a managing director at the uh, Pro Training Australia. Um, we'll talk about new cash and how to do your finance. Thank you. Excellent. Just a quick starting point. I'm coming. Um, I'm talking to you f about this from the perspective of a user. I don't know much about the GNU Cash code, but I've been using GNU Cash to manage my personal and business finances for at least six years now. So, back when it was really hard to install and such, that's when I started using it. But it's really cool now. I've got lots to tell you. So, the quick starting question: Who here? Put your hand up thinks they have a pretty good idea of how much money they earn each year post-tax. To maybe say about a grand. Okay, what if, could you look it up easily? Put your hand up if you could just go and find it out pretty easily. Didn't have to like add it up in your bank statement. Excellent. Most of you might know this stuff. And who here has a pretty good idea, again within a grand, of how much they spend each year or could look it up easily? How much do you spend each year? Excellent. You're in the wrong room. <laughs> Knowing this information is absolutely essential if you want to start a business or continue running a business successfully. Without financial discipline, you can't tell if you're making money or saving money in the short term. Of course, you may see numbers going up in the longer term, but do you really want to risk it? If you're starting a business, how do you know that you're going to survive until that first invoice gets paid? As Paul and I have been asked for advice on starting businesses a few times, we always say, it's going to take you six months to get any money. And that's assuming you get a client quite quickly. Because you get the client, you negotiate the work, eventually you invoice them, eventually they notice that they were invoiced, you chase them, and maybe you get paid. And it could take six months. Hopefully you can survive that long. Now I'm going to give a quick overview of the of five key personal finance rules. Basically, personal finance in a nutshell. Picture looks way cooler on my screen. That might be a problem. Okay. This one works out okay. So the most important one: spend less than you earn. Nice, easy, straightforward. If you're spending a lot less than you earn, you're saving money which you can do fun things with. <laughs> Eventually, yes. I mean, there's no point dying a millionaire if you could have had more fun the year beforehand. Now, of course, if you spend more than you earn, you'll either eat through all your savings or grow your debt. Not that, not that exciting. To achieve this, you may need to earn more money. You might want to start up a business because that might give you more money or drain more money. But you don't know. You may be why you're in this mini conf. I want to earn more money somehow. And some ideas here. Or work on spending less to increase that difference between how much you spend and earn. Increase how much you earn and decrease how much you spend. Look at what areas of your life you could get away with spending less money in. Evaluate what's really important to you. Perhaps the coffee you have every morning is like your lifeline and you're happy to spend money on that, but spend less in areas that aren't quite so important to you. Yes. Oh, yes. The 10-second rule is if you're going to make a big-ish purchase, and whatever that word big-ish means to you, might be more than $50, might be more than $500, spend 10 seconds saying, do I really need to buy this now? Could I buy this next month? Could I go and do more research? Those kind of things. A lot of people buy on impulse, but if they just spent 10 seconds going, no, actually, I don't need to, they'd put it back. Thank you. And now, of course, that you're spending less than you earn, you just need to manage your money wisely. And this talk should help you just a little bit, just to give you some techniques to get started there. Get, but first of all, you need to, of course, get your existing debts under control 
and manage your superannuation and other investments. And one of the most important points I like on this slide here is point two, establish an emergency fund, such that when things do go wrong, as things inevitably do, you don't need to pay for it with a loan, or you don't need to draw against your savings, all those things. You have this fund there that just sits there to buffer you against unexpected bills. Not so much bills that you should have expected, but ones that came completely out of the blue. And once all of that's done, you have financial freedom. You have the opportunity to have, you're in a great position to decide upon your future, the opportunity to spend money or not on the, and achieve your dreams. So this talk is about GNU Cash and specifically how you can manage your finances with GNU Cash. Now GNU Cash has a whole bunch of features, which I'm just going to really skim over. But just to give you a quick idea of what kind of things it can do, there's no way that I could cover all of them in 25 minutes, especially if I have to leave some time for questions. So it can handle personal accounting. It can handle small and medium business accounting, but it's only the accounting side of things. It can do invoicing, but it doesn't do inventory management and those kind of things. It can import and export to and from popular commercial tools. So if you have your books currently in Myob, for example, you can export from there, import it into GNU Cash, and off you go. So if you don't like your current tool, there is a possibility that you could move to using GNU Cash which doesn't charge you yearly licensing fees. It has double entry accounting, which I'll talk more about later. It allows you to track your income and expenses. It would be a pretty bad tool if it didn't. It allows you to, it encourages you to do reconciliation of statements. It can handle these things and those things. Financial calculators, I actually quite regularly enjoy using the financial calculators to say, well, if I was earning this much interest from this principal and all that, where would I be? Or you pick any of these variables to change and see where you could, um, what you need to be earning to get to places. It's quite fun. Has reports and graphs, which again I'll cover later. Since 2.2.9, which is a little older, but not terribly, maybe a year, it's been available on Windows and Mac as well. For the last six years, it was Linux only. So yay, if you have more than one operating system. It's been easy to compile because all the main Linux distributions ship the required libraries since 2.05, which is good because it used to be really hard to install. It's written in C and Scheme, and they are not willing to change that. They have a big FAQ section on it, so we will not change it. Currently, all the data is stored in self-contained files, but they're deciding that maybe it would be good to use SQLite, and they're expecting that in, in 2.4.0, which should, ba based on the current cycle, probably should be out by the end of the year, possibly mid-year-ish, depending on how enthusiastic the volunteers are. Dev releases are coming out every two months, so they're having lots of fun with it. And all of this in a free and open source financial package. Awesome. There are alternatives. Perhaps you don't like a new cash. I can show you a bunch of things and you can walk away going, that's not really what I was looking for. So I'm just going to show you that there are a few other alternatives you can explore, but I'm not really going to talk about them much. SQL Ledger is a server-based accounting system. It's designed for small and medium enterprises. It's a web-based interface. More than one person can update at a time. It does inventory and things like that as well, and wages. SMB, or Ledger SMB is a fork of the previous one, so it does all the same things in a different way. And if you looked in your conference bags, you'd have also noticed that Amber DMS um, is advertised. It's another free option. I heard about it first time at the end of, I'm oh, sorry, during LTA last year. Looked very exciting, but I'm still enjoying GNU Cash. So let's get started. Back to GNU Cash. When you start GNU Cash for the first time, oh good, you can see that. You get a screen that looks like this, which is a completely unexciting and in many situations might make you go, that looks too hard, I have no idea what to do now. What you do now is you create yourself a new accounts page. The accounts page is a listing of all of the 
accounts you have, as opposed to a ledger, which we'll get to as well. Now, as we haven't got any accounts, we have a number of options we could do here. If we were importing our accounts from an existing tool, this is the stage at which we would import all those accounts. Or if we just knew what accounts we wanted to set up, this is the stage where we would set up the accounts manually. But there's also a handy wizard that allows us to set up all the accounts that GNU Cache thinks we might want to start with. And that's what we're going to do here. So we go back up to our menu, and here we've got some new menus that have now appeared because we have an accounts page. And we say we want a new account hierarchy. And it says, hey, here's a wizard. Would you like to use it? And we say, of course we would. So we say forward. Now, what we actually get is a very large number of possible categories of, of things we might want to store. Business accounts, car loan, simple checkbook. There's even budget things in here as well. And if we click on any of these, in the accounts in the category will be shown to us. These are all the accounts that this will automatically add for us. So, for example, if we click on com um, common accounts, these are all the things that will be added by default. Now, these are US-centric. Most people in Australia wouldn't really make a distinction between a checking account and a savings account. And that's okay. If we don't like any of these, we can delete them later. Or if we want to add extra ones, we can add them later. This is just a really good starting point. We could also add a home loan or a car loan. It's got education loan here. It has a bunch of those things to allow you to have the flexibility you need. Once we've selected these, we have the option of adding in some starting values. I usually keep my accounts from financial year to financial year, so mid-year to mid-year. So at this stage, we're six and a half months into the financial set of books. I could be really lazy and not create the books until July the 1st, or I could say, no, nope, I'm enthused, I'm going to go and do this right away. But if I, if I do this right away, I want to represent something about what's happened in the last six and a half months. So to my best of my knowledge, I fill in all the information that I have for these opening balances, what they accumulated in the last six and a half months. So we just fill those in as we want. We can leave some of them blank. We can leave all of them blank. That's okay. And that creates us our set of accounts here. Now, these are all closed up. You can see we've got all those arrows there. We can um, open them up. And just the sum totals. I own my house, so the equity is quite large. And somehow I've managed to spend $24,000 in expenses already. It's possibly a bit high for me, really. But there you go. And we can see what these expand into. So there's the house, other assets, there's a car, checking accounts and such. What we'll actually find is that large amount of money in my expenses is because of tax. And we might decide later that actually we'd prefer to put tax in a different category rather than just straight into the expenses. These are things we can do, either now or later. Now, of course, our books don't magically track once we've created them what expenses we've received. Unfortunately, those bills come in the mail, and you have to actually add them in manually. So let's imagine I've got a telephone bill. It's arrived. I want to, make, I want to add it into my books. I find the right, the right ledger, in this case, phone, and just click on it. And that gets me the ledger. Now, the ledger is very unexciting at this stage. It's just got the opening balance. But we add in the fields. Date, the number of the bill, the identifying bill number, if we care. I usually ignore it. A description, something I'm going to remember it by. Where the money came from, how much it cost. If, for some reason, the phone company was giving me money back, that would go into the rebate column instead. So here's an example that I filled in. Now, this one was the issue date is the date that I record rather than the payment date. It doesn't really matter which, as long as you're consistent. And this is before I started my books. But that's okay. GNU Cash doesn't really care where, how these things all sort. So there's a Virgin Mobile bill, and it costs a bit of money. Nice and easy. Now, this is our credit card ledger, because if I go back one, I did say here that where the money comes from is from our liabilities credit card. And if we go and look at our credit card ledger, this is what it looks like. It's got the same information, except here it's saying the money is going to the expenses phone. 
And if we look at them both together, we can see that they match up. This is the double entry accounting thing that I was talking about, which is a centuries old principle. Back a long time ago, they used to actually have one book per ledger, despite it being double entry accounting, it should probably be multiple entry accounting. One book per ledger, and you would go and you'd write it in each book as appropriate. The idea is that money always comes from somewhere. If, if money comes from income, then it comes from a special income account. And the special thing about an income account is that it increases as well as where the money goes to increasing. So they both increase. So your work gives you money, that increases the amount of money that work has given you, and the money goes into your bank account, which increases the amount of money in your bank account. Usually when we spend money, money goes from a, a source of, from an asset, such as our bank account, and then into some category of things we've spent. So that's the money always goes somewhere. Money doesn't disappear in this system. Most expense ledgers only ever go up, but occasionally you will get refunds and then they would go down just by a fraction. And of course, each transaction therefore requires two accounts. Notice even if you're um, throwing money around, such as transferring it to your credit card or transferring it between bank accounts, there's always that still, it comes from here and went to there. Unbalanced transactions are a mistake and GNU Cash will flag them for you. Okay, so we're now recording our expenses, which means, of course, this piece of information becomes really important. Rather than saying, oh, no, I don't want a receipt, you now need to go, yes, please, give me a receipt. I want to collect as many pieces of paper as I possibly can. Nice thick wallet. I highly recommend that you keep your receipts at least for those things you pay by uh, on your key card or by your credit card. And I actually encourage you to think about uh, keeping them for your, your cash receipts as possible. Cash is a hard one because a lot of places won't give you a receipt if you just spend like $2 on a coffee. So it's probably a cheap coffee. What I usually do is I've got a little box that sits on my desk. It's actually a little red gift box. And I, I don't know, every few days to a week, take the, all the great big wad of receipts out of my purse, throw them in the box, put the lid back on, and worry about them later. And when I have enough of them, I go through and add them all in, and it works fine. But how often is enough of them? Well, enough of them for me is actually a maze of, I couldn't possibly bear to do it daily. It would drive me nuts if I had to do all my accounting daily. I probably wouldn't even do it weekly. But I actually find that if I wait until my credit card and my bank statement have both arrived for the month, that's about perfect. And then I sit down and I do my accounting on those, upon those, receiving those statements, and it takes about four hours a month, which seems sort of like a lot, but it's good. It's enough time to give me a good chance to understand how I'm going financially. Now, what if you want to create a new category? You've got a new expense. You've gone, oh, this is kind of interesting. What am I going to do about it? Perhaps you just bought a car or acquired a home loan, or perhaps you've got a new hobby, something that's costing you money, or perhaps you've got a new asset class. You have just bought something on behalf of your business, and they're going to pay you back. That's what I'm showing here. So here, my flight's to LCA. I run a business. My business can pay for the flight's to LCA. It just happens to be that I paid for them right now. This is my credit card ledger. And as you can see, I've added a few things since then. So flights to LCA, and I'm creating this one. Assets, you can't see the first word, I'm afraid. Assets, fixed assets, employer rebate. Now, Knuka says, oh, I've never seen that account before. Perhaps you've typoed, perhaps you actually want to create it. And I say, yes, absolutely, I'd like to create it. And what we get now is a window that allows us to actually set that up. The important things to notice here is that if I got the parent account wrong, I can now fix that. If I want to change the account type, which I probably don't, but if I want to change the account type, I can, I can look at changing that too. That may change the, uh, the available parents to me. And that last one I encourage you to look at up there is the tax-related box. If you tick the tax-related box on all of your accounts which are tax-related, then GNU Cash makes it a little bit easier just to sort by, or just to provide reports that are based on things that are tax related, which in theory would help you at tax time. GNU Cash isn't set up to do anything magic for the 
Australian tax for, for personal, personal or for business, but that's okay. It's sufficient, I find. I actually find it quite easy to fill in my tax return based on the, the reports I can get out of Cash. Once you've received a statement, of course, you're going to want to reconcile it. Does everything in my books match everything in my statement? Chances are they don't. Either you'll have been given interest by the bank or possibly charged interest by the bank, hopefully not. But you, there might be a couple of discrepancies. That's about, this is the time where you can catch those. For reconciling, the easiest way is just from your ledger to go up to the reconcile action. And GNU Cash will get your statement date. It'll probably get it wrong the first time, but get it right every, every time after, as long as your statements are monthly. And it will guess how much you owe, which is usually wrong, but not too bad. So you usually have to fill in how much you owe. It could be wrong for just something as easy as you put in something that you bought, or you filled in a, a, from a receipt, but the bank hasn't received that charge yet because the terminal was down or something. Happens a lot. Okay, so that once we do that, we find, we, we get a screen like this, which is all of our things we've bought, all of the things we've paid in a sense, and we just tick them off, both in the paper version and in the in GNU cash. If something doesn't match, you add that entry to your books, and this will automatically be updated. If it's fraudulent, if you spot somewhere where the bank hasn't told you that there'll be a fraudulent transaction, you still enter it into your books, but you put it into a category such as, under, as disputed transactions. But you want to still actually achieve reconciliation here. Most of the time, it'll be just a little thing. When everything does match, the difference down here will be zero which means, ha-ha, success, you've managed, to, you've managed to reconcile your books for this month. Then you've got next month. Once you've finished reconciling, you have the option. This is something you could turn off if you don't think you'd like it. You add the payment. So you've got your credit card, you've a receipt, you've reconciled it, and you can say to the new cash, this is when I'm paying it. It doesn't actually care how far in the future you pay it. Um, I usually try to pay it a day or two before it's due. So I would um, schedule that with direct debit. So here I've got the date and it's coming from my savings account. And here it's now under a blue line. The blue line says that it, this is in the future. This hasn't happened yet. Just to delineate what has happened and what is about to happen. So what about cash? All of these ideas work perfectly because we can reconcile our statements. We get our bills, we pay them somehow, usually not with cash, and we reconcile them. And this keeps our, our books going beautifully, but cash is this really awkward thing because it's anonymous and we don't always get receipts and it's kind of a bit awkward. You don't get statements for the cash you spent. I saw this in The Age just a, a couple of, oh, maybe a week ago. What date do I have there? On the 12th. More than a third of the $176 total cash spent per person per week, this is in Australia, or $59 a week cannot be counted for. This money is just disappearing. People do not know what they spent this money on. Now, most people will, will suffer this to an extent. You, you go and you spend a coffee, uh, some money on a coffee. That costs you $4. A week later, you're going, where did I spend my money last week? The coffee probably doesn't feature highly in your, your memory. Perhaps you throw some money to a street musician to say, you know, good job. You probably won't remember, oh, yeah, that was like $1.43. It all adds up. All the same, keep the receipts you have so that you minimize that gap of that unknown amount of money. It's better to know that you've spent $80 on drinks and beer over the weekend then, spend, then wake up on Monday morning and go, I'm sure I should have more money in my wallet. What did I do with it? I'm sure you've never had that experience. So enter what you can and adjust what you can't. There will always be some money lost, and that goes into this account here. Expenses adjustment. The money that I don't remember I spent. My cash expense. 
Finocache also will give you some reports. And this is actually quite, quite important because it gives you a chance to actually see where your money's going, what your money's doing. I find after a while that I'm so busy entering all the data that I can't actually see the bigger picture, that I can't see, am I making money or losing money just by looking at the numbers. It's like, I've just entered $6,000 worth of expenses. Did I, like, come out ahead? I don't know. So we can use reports, which are in our reports menu. And in this case, I'm just going to look at the expense pie cut chart. But as you can see, there's quite a variety of reports we could have here. Now, of course, some of these are business-focused, so we wouldn't find them quite as exciting, but income expense ones are all, all ones that you might find useful. So here's an example expense report. This is for the filled-in credit card statement that I created before. And we can see that our taxes are actually a large category. Now, usually, as I, I said earlier, you'd probably pull your taxes out of expense because expenses are things, in a sense, you could have avoided paying. Our taxes usually don't fall into that category, not for all of us anyway. And then we have utilities and other. Other is, an, is not a category I've created. Other is all the little things that sort of added up, but we're individually too small to get a slice of the pie. If we removed taxes, many of the other, the other category would be much smaller because we'd have much more space to fill in the pie. Now, if we want to do that, we have a large number of options we can use. We can change when the report starts and ends from. We can look at over a six-month period, over a week's period. We can say over the year or over the financial year. We can also here affect which accounts are used. So we can just say, just show me these expenses. Just show me the ones that I mark as related to entertainment. Just show me the ones that are related to costs I must spend in order to live, such as internet. But there's a big secret about personal finance. And I, I, I always have fun discovering when people don't quite get this one. It's not actually about getting or being rich. Doing your finances isn't about having lots of money or even wanting to have lots of money. It's about freedom, which is a goal I'm sure we all have in common. It's about giving yourself freedom. Knowing how much money you have, knowing your financial situation gives you the freedom to fix your financial situation if, if it needs fixing, or if it's in a nice stable position, gives you the freedom to do something like start your own business, or at least give it a go. Or retire early. If you know how much you're earning and how much you're saving and what you've got, you might be able to say, well, I'm going to retire by this age and actually be able to achieve that. Or just go on long holidays. Go overseas every year. If you've got the money and that's what you want to do with, your t do with it, you now have the freedom because you know what you can afford. So ideally, it's really about achieving your dreams. So I encourage you to go and secure your future. Set your future up so that you can succeed and get your house into order. And here's the time for questions and discussion. Thank you. Yes. Yes, there will be a run around mic. Hi. Um, I'm really interested in, I just started putting all my finances into this and it was really great. But then I'm wondering how to budget because I know the budgeting stuff in that, but it doesn't really do much. How do I, how do I forecast like my holiday savings in the next year or two years? Or? Oh, excellent. That's a good question. So you know that GNU Cash has budgeting such, which is kind of cool. I'll get, come back to that in just a second. But how do you, you use that to, become, to set it up so you can make it save for a holiday and such? Yeah. Okay, the budgeting of GNU Cash is sort of retrospective budgeting. It's you enter all of your expenses for a time so that you know how much you're spending. And then you say, I want to spend less than this amount on each of these categories. And you, the budgets can't be any more specific than your set of accounts. So if you care about the difference between your mobile phone account and your landline account, then you need to break those into two different ledgers. 
This is so everyone else knows too. One, the, the key thing about budgeting, Blue Cash has no idea what you want to limit those numbers to. So you have to you have to apply those limits, and then of course you have to do whatever is required to make sure that you don't hit, um, don't exceed them. So you know how much is coming in, I would hope. It de depends. I mean, some jobs you have no idea how much is coming in, but you know how much is coming in, and so you've got a, a matter of allocating that and saying, well, this is my savings. And actually, as a non GNU cash thing, but as a general recommendation thing, one of the best ways to make that easy is to have your bank automatically separate that small chunk you want to save into a separate savings account every time you get your paycheck. Because then if it's not in your regular bank account, it's going to be just a little bit harder to, to spend. As, as a, um, a tool, I'm not really sure what I can recommend you can do. As a, a GNU Cash will help you see where you're go regularly going over budget. And you can take a number of things and put them into a big thing. Like you might want to say entertainment covers movies and going to the theater and going scuba diving. That, they're certainly all in my entertainment section. And you say, overall, I want to spend less than, uh, I don't know, $200 a quarter on entertainment, then at least you've got that as a goal that you can, GNU Cash can help you track. Um, so one thing I did was um, I have my amount of money in my bank, and I knew I needed some money for my trip to New Zealand. So I just split it into a separate so you can do like set accounts underneath accounts? Yes, you can, yes. So that I said New Zealand, I put the amount, and then I also want to say when I get home, I need to go to a wedding, so I had money for the wedding. And that's how I did it, but it doesn't really do what I thought it would do. What like, did you think it would do? <laughs> um, well, it shows you the total in the bank account, and then I've got the amount and the other amount, but it, it doesn't like minus it from the top one. It does when you spend it, but it doesn't when you've just allocated it. Oh, no, well, you see, when you start creating sub-accounts, the parent account effectively becomes a placeholder, mm. which is the sum of everything beneath it. You'd have to actually, if you wanted it not to be counted in that, you'd have to actually make it its own separate account. Yeah, which it's not. Oh, it's separate, just separate level account. account. Yeah. You may, as I, again, if you had moved it to a saving account, with, mm. your, with a separate saving account, or even a, like the ING yeah. um, online banks allow you to have nominal savings accounts. They're not real yeah, actual yeah. things, but they, they spread the money around the way you're, you, you're sort of looking that it would do. And if you had that kind of setup, then you could reflect that in GNU Cash quite well as well. Mm. All right, thanks. Yes? Um, yeah, um, I've been using GNU Cash for the last uh, six months or so. Excellent. And one of the hardest bits I've had um, to get my head around every time I go to enter in there is I use um, split transactions for... Uh, doing the GST yes. um, and the cost, uh, the, the real price of the, but to me it always seems to be the putting the information is around the wrong way, and uh, I know it'd be hard for you to demonstrate it without a real live version here, but I was just wondering if there's an easier way of getting my mind around the uh, filling those details out when it comes to a split transaction, especially with the GST side of things. Yes, I sort of left the split transactions off because I wanted to focus on the personal side of things no. and. This would be more of a business issue, I would imagine. Yeah. But yes, um, I find actually now this may have changed in the version of GNU Cash you're using than the ancient-ish one that I use on a regular basis. But with split transactions, you can actually have your money coming from or going to more than one transact, more than one ledger, as well as the double entry. So this is the multi-entry. So you've, you you write in your thing this much, you split it, and you say, well. For example, you've gone out to, to dinner with a bunch of friends. This is one I do use on a personal basis quite often. You go out to dinner with a bunch of friends. You paid for the entire thing on your credit card, but each of them gave you $20. So you've got a certain amount that's gone into your wallet cash-wise, and of course you've got how much you spent for your dinner as well. So you split the transaction and you say, and maybe someone owes you money as well, just to make it more complicated. You split the transaction, and on one side you say, um, this is how much I spent on my credit card, because that's what you're going to need for reconciliation later. Then with the, um, the left-hand side, you might say cash in wallet or other people's share or whatever. That went into cash and however much that was. My share, that, went into, that comes from my expenses of going out to dinner and whatever that was, $20. And Fred owes me, and that goes into the asset 
of a loan that is Fred's. Maybe it doesn't exist, but you can create it. And then however much that is. And that works out quite well from a personal side of things. Now, a gist here is a kind of interesting one. I find that it doesn't really matter which order you put the, the items in. So I usually just write, you know, let's say I was buying a computer. Something we'd never do over here. So I'm buying a computer, I might write um, hardware, and that goes into my expenses hardware category. And then just, I just put in the GST because it auto fills, having seen that before, it knows to put that into the appropriate liability. And I put the amount in. And as long as I'm doing it where I spend the money, rather than doing it in the GST registrar, register, or ledger, that makes more sense, rather than doing it in the GST ledger, it actually works out quite easily. Um, are you approaching it from the GST ledger rather than from... Yep. Yeah, I was going to say that what's confusing is it wants the non-GST figure and the GST, and then it adds them up and gives you the total. Um, but what it displays is the non-GST. So oh, yes. Yeah, and then if you don't do it, you get a, um, what is it, an imbalance or whatever Unbalanced it is. Unbalanced transaction, yeah, yeah. yes. And to me, that was confusing. That I, I, know, I know how much it cost me, and I've done the divide by nine to get the GST, and so it should, it should be giving the, you know, it works out the non-GST, but it seems to be around the wrong way that it's, it wants non-GST and the GST, and then it will work out what the actual total value is. Um, and to me, it just, it just it's obviously my, um, I've had to write down a little note, a little cheat sheet to say, well, this is what I need to put in each of these fields, and it will work out the other one for me. Yes, the reason <laughs> it wants the non-GST amount is because that's the amount you actually spent on okay. hardware. Yeah. Whereas okay. the total amount, inclusive of GST, is the amount that you've effectively lost from your bank account. Yeah. But the GST is probably going to be remitted back to you. Yeah, yeah. And so that's a separate thing from the, 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 the charge you actually paid for. So, yes, I could see that it would be confusing, but after a while you just go, yeah, yes, because uh, that's how much I spent, and then there was this tax yeah. that got thrown As I said, on. I've got a little cheat sheet that I use to, you know, just buy this bit I fill in, this bit I fill in, and it will work out the other ones. So, yeah, thanks. Absolutely. Any other questions? Yes, Andrew. Yeah, follow on from that. That seems to me that that's a distinction in the way taxes are handled, um, and I, I wonder whether GNU Cash has a way of handling that appropriately, because you'll note that, for example, in the US, taxes are usually um, extrinsic, whereas in Australia, the GST is intrinsic. The distinction there is that in some places, the price that's shown that you pay is the price excluding tax, and you add the tax on afterwards, and in some countries, the price that you pay is the price including the tax, and you deduct the tax out after you've already paid. And so the way you think about it is quite different, because in, in countries like the US, you think about it as, oh, yes, I've got to remember to add on my, my taxes, my state tax, my county tax. And the way you think about it in Australia is the exact opposite. You think, oh, this is how much it costs. Oh, by the way, I'm going to get a rebate on this. Does GNU Cash let you handle that in two distinct ways or not? Because if does. not, that could be where the confusion is. It doesn't when you're adding the item into the ledger in the sense of a, a one-off purchase because it just wants, it's, when you use a split transaction, it just wants you to split it each up. This amount goes into this ledger, this amount goes into this ledger, and, it's, and so on. And that's well, but both systems do that because both systems you have to split off the amount. What I'm, what I'm suggesting is that because there are two different ways we psychologically think I, I, about it. I do it, understand. Yeah. So it with the split transactions, there's no easy way to say this is the total, you work it out. With expenses, so, so which, with regular things such as a vendor statement, like we pay for printing a lot, so we get invoices from our printer. You can set per vendor whether or not those invoices will be GST inclusive. You add the, add the, the information and it will do the right thing, fill in the right tables. Likewise, when you're creating invoices, you can set per client whether or not they will be GST inclusive, and again, it will do the right thing. So it does understand that there are these things, but when you're talking about one-off expenses versus vendor and invoices, you, you are actually entering the ledgers in, in, in their entirety, which means you have to do the splitting yourself. Fortunately, you can actually do the maths inside those boxes. So I just say this amount times 11 on 10 or, uh, or nine, nine, uh, 10 on 11 or, as appropriate. Yes. Um, oh. Just to go back to one of the questions that we had earlier, um, uh, the lady was talking about wanting to know um, how her... Um, 
wanting to spend so much money on the trip to New Zealand was going to affect her cash flow. Is that what the question? Yeah. And the fundamental difference that I found using GNU Cash with some other software, um, the key was that I couldn't find an easy way in GNU Cash to help me do forecasting moving forward as opposed to reporting on what I've done previously. And it's a fundamental difference because as a person, I don't want to run out of money. I know that I haven't run out of money because I haven't received a call from the bank manager. Yes. But I don't want to do it in the future. Um, and I know there's some other tools that I can use that are not open source that give me the flexibility to be able to forecast my cash flow. I'm wondering, is that possible in GNU Cash? I honestly have no idea. I, I would love to be able to answer that question. Perhaps someone else can, but I can't. I don't think it does. I think there was a question at the front here. Yes? Do we have an extra mic? Um, it's not actually a question, but just a, a gotcha for anybody um, who wants to use GNU Cash for business in New Zealand, and it might be the case in Australia as well. Um, we're required by law for our invoices in New Zealand to say the words tax invoice across the top. Um, you can't actually do this without hacking the source code of um, GNU Cash at the current time. It's quite an easy fix. And I think you'll find it on the FAQ page how to do it, and it is literally anybody could do it with a text editor. But it's just one to bear in mind if you're if you're wanting to use it for business in New Zealand. And that would be the same problem in Australia as well. That invoices that include GST must say tax invoice. I actually don't use GNU Cash for generating my invoices. I just put them in in retrospect. So I was unaware of that. Any other statements or questions? Okay, that's probably it. Oh, yes, one last one. I'd Just one last one. Can you say something about using the, you're saying uh, a file for each financial year? Because um, when I started using the new cache, I just kept one file running um, over the years, and that, got, that gets large. So how do you um, manage, is that what you're talking about, different accounts? For financial years? You could have different accounts for financial years with one great big file as well. I actually like the ability to say how am I going this year as opposed to previous years financially. So show me which areas have increased or show me all of my expenses for all the years by year so I can say, oh look, my expenditure on let's say entertainment, which includes scuba diving and that kind of thing, has rapidly gone up over the last few years. Maybe I should rein that in a little. Or interestingly, it's gone down. Maybe I should, you know, maybe I have changed my interests to cheaper ones. Scuba diving being a fantastic sport, but somewhat expensive. So um, you could have a different one. When I, what I was really talking about when I said that was more that I just like, I, I, I want to, I conceptualize my, my monetary expenditure on financial year boundaries. So it's not so much that I change the books, it's just that I would go, as I, when I was creating these, these um, sample accounts, I was thinking, well, I want to show you something new and all of that, but there's six and a half months worth of data. So just try to represent that to give an idea as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.